Dr. Nancy Moonstar, creator of A Man's Guide to Intimacy, Three Secrets to Keeping Her Wanting, Sizzling, and Forever Yours. And we have this wonderful being who has an unusual lifestyle, who is so energetic, uses no limits, and preaches and teaches and coaches people no limits around the world. His name is TJ Dixon, but he goes by TJ. Hello, TJ. Hello, hello, my beautiful people. And I love that you're doing something for men. Why? Because men don't get on these as much. Men don't get the attention that they need and that they deserve if we're really wanting to bring the couples together, the, the um, masculine and the feminine energy together, then we want to make sure that we're also nurturing the men because they're not often as receptive. And the ones that are going to be on here are that much more receptive than all of the others. So this is going to be like a wonderful opportunity for us to, to, to just fill you up. Um, and hold on, I'm sort of, there's something that's coming to me and I want to say it, but give me a sec to find where it is. Oh, right. This idea that the masculine and the feminine are complements of each other, not contrasting, not opposites of each other, mm -hmm. but they're complements. So when you as the man are in your masculine, masculinity doesn't necessarily mean aggression or assertiveness or um, resistance or, you know, uh, no emotion. It just means like in this, this genuine space where you want to love, you want to nurture, but you also want to protect, you want to provide for, you want to lift up, you want to be attentive to. It's just another way of showing attention. It's just the universe communicating with the universe, God talking to God. It's all namaste. Right. I love that. I love that. So, you know, I want to ask you some questions about you and how you do your life, because since you present no limits and yet you're somebody who's in a wheelchair, yeah. you have you have muscular dystrophy and um, even your limbs. And I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you do emails? How did you get scheduled on my book even twice that you were giving me extra time? Chopstick. I, I type with my mouth and I paint with my mouth. And I can type 25 words a minute. I can type as fast with my with my the chopstick in my mouth than I can as I can um, when I used to be able to type with my fingers. And um, like you said, super duper skinny. And I actually got really sick in March and April of 2019, and I lost like 85 percent of my physical strength. And when I lost that, I had a choice, right? I can be sad, I can be depressed, I can be angry, I can be hurt, I can be scared, all of those things. But none of those things feel good. And so I just opted and chose, like, I want to still be happy. Maybe I don't like how weak I am now. Maybe I don't like the fact that I'm in, I basically am in a new body now. Maybe I don't like the fact that I have to pay, you know, for personal care five times as much, literally five times as much, uh, minimally three times, but as much as five times as much as I used to pay for out of my own pocket. I may not like those things, but I like being happy. I like being joyful. I like being filled with love. I like being filled with kindness and compassion. So it's a constant choice. And so as I speak back to kind of reference what you were saying, you see how skinny I am, right? Little tiny skinny arms, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they look a little bigger on me. Maybe I, the camera adds 10 pounds. Look at that, I'm bumped up. <laughs> um, so yeah, and you know, I've got a crazy curvature on my spine. Like right now my belly button is sitting on the seat between my thighs, you know, mm -hmm. and I curve back upright. Um, so there's like plenty of space back there for a little kid to sit, you know, like uh, piggybacking only it's piggy bottoming for me because my bottom is sticking out. So, you know, it's all good. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is where is your heart? Where is your attention? Where is your mind? Right? What are you doing to contribute? What are you doing to recognize what you have? What are you bringing out? Because a lot of times disabled men, especially might look and say, well, I don't have anything available. I'm not good enough. I'm not valuable enough. That woman's never going to like me. If you don't like you, she's not going to see the value of you. My friends and family even get out of the car sometimes, and walk away, and they turn around, and they come back, and they go, sorry, dude, I forgot you're in a chair. I got to get it. Right? They forget that I'm in a wheelchair because I don't pay attention to it. So if we don't pay attention to what we don't have, we would rather pay attention to what we can give and provide. The world becomes better for everyone. Wow, that's a beautiful message. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, so, so getting back to men and uh, working with men on this series, um, I, I noticed too that men hesitate, don't expose themselves, get into self-development. General, There's plenty of exceptions. You're one. <laughs> so um, tell, talk a little bit about that and maybe 
what you'd like to see, what's your greatest vision for men to accomplish with intimacy? So I believe, let me back up, right? I believe that men went astray first. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that <clears throat> the masculine and the feminine from both a spiritual as well as an emotional, psychological, um, physiological, uh, sociological standpoint are complements of each other. They nurture each other. They support each other. While the masculine often has this pushing out against everything in the world, not like aggressively necessarily, but we're constantly like pushing out from ourselves to see what's out there and also to sort of push against other men to see like where I stand on the hierarchy. Um, women come along and there's this softness to them. There's this grace, there's this femininity, there's this nurturing. And when women come along and they embrace the masculine, the masculine softens. It's the one time, not necessarily the one time, but the most common time when men will actually soften a little. And it's something that we drink in. It's like we haven't drank anything in the desert for three or four days or a week. And all of a sudden we just, we just breathe it in. We drink it in. Like we love the smell of women. We love the, you know, the, just the feel of that, that nurturing sense. And so we soften. And so the reason I say this is because um, I believe that we went astray first, which means that we stopped appreciating women. We started taking them for granted. And I don't believe that healthy relationships are give and take. I believe that healthy relationships are give and receive. There's a profound difference between taking and receiving. And so I think what happened is, you know, we would historically come back from the hunt. And then, you know, the women, again, historically, um, might have been gathering the berries and planting crops and taking care of the kids. And we came back and we just assumed and expected it. We stopped being grateful for everything that they were doing. Because maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe because we didn't see it all day long. We didn't see the effort that they went through. We didn't participate in it. So we don't know how backbreaking the farming was, how difficult it was to watch, keep the children safe, how far they had to walk, you know, to get berries and fruits and nuts and roots and things like that. So we might not have appreciated that because we didn't see it. But what's interesting is that women continue to appreciate what men would bring home. Right, and so I'm getting to the to your answer. So I believe that men went astray first, which means we stopped paying attention to women, and we stopped giving, uh, uh, being appreciative. And once we stopped being appreciative, <clears throat> then they felt like they were taken for granted. And if you ever feel taken for granted, then in that moment, it's not a healthy relationship. I'm not suggesting that it's never healthy, but in that moment, it's not a healthy relationship. Um, and so. What I would like to see from men is to return to this unity with their partner, with that compliment, right? And honestly, I don't care if you're gay or straight or both. It doesn't matter to me. What I care about is do you have love in your heart? Are you kind? Are you generous? Are you gentle? Um, and one of the greatest quotes for me was hanging on my wall when I was a boy. It was attributed to Apache, Native Apache Indians, Native Americans. Um, uh, as a Native American Apache saying. However, I've also seen it attributed to, I think, a French um, monastic. So I don't know who really said it. Um, but the saying says, there's nothing so strong as gentleness. Nothing mm -hmm. so gentle as real strength. Mm -hmm. There's nothing so strong as gentleness. Nothing so gentle as real strength. To me, that's the definition of a man. When I was a boy, nine and 10 years old, this picture, of an, an Apache native um, was on my wall. And it was super cool because he represented to me the strength of masculinity, the power of being a warrior. But there was also this, this calm on his face, right? This presence in the look in his eyes. And I read that, no lie, Nancy, I must've read that a thousand, possibly 10,000 times. I distinctly remember standing there in my little leg braces because I could walk at the time, looking up at that and reading it and reading it. It never crossed my mind to ask my mom and dad what it meant. I don't know why I didn't. It just never crossed my mind. So I read it over and over and over because I desperately wanted to understand that. I'm almost in tears because I desperately wanted to read that or to know what that meant. 
And that became the mantra for my life. So what do I want to see? I want to see men return to that softer side, but not lose the warrior that's inside of them. I want men to connect with other men, support other men, and make sure that if they're struggling emotionally, that they are there for each other and can lift each other up. Because men have a very difficult time going to women and saying, hey, I'm struggling because we don't want you as a woman to see the weakness in us. We're afraid you won't love us still. We mm -hmm. desperately want to be loved. We don't want to lose that femininity. And so we want to be seen as strong. So we don't communicate with you the way we should and want to. So I'd love to see that return also. Mm -hmm. There is that level of, I trust you so much more than anyone else on the face of the planet. I'm going to share with you, even though I'm weak right now, I don't want you to think that I'm weak. I want to skip that. I don't want you to think that I'm weak because after I get through it, she's going to love me more. She's going to love you more. She's going to be more connected because women just want their men to share. They just want that intimate connection. So when men learn to talk about, to identify their emotions, communicate about their emotions and still stay in their strength or return to their strength, right? Like, thanks, babe. I really feel better. Or, you know, give me a couple of days to sort of process this and I promise I'll come back. Everything will be good. Not like I'm going to leave you. Just this idea of, you know, I'm still journaling. I'm still thinking. I'm still communicating with my brothers in arms to see, you know, and I say brothers in arms because I like this idea of men locking shields together against, you know, the, adver the adversity of the world, the enemy of the world, which is distraction mm -hmm. and lies, right? Because the real truth lies in the heart. When we face each other, there's that connection. If, if you don't interrupt me, I'm going to talk for days. I love this stuff. So okay. this is what I want for men. I want men to return to a softer side without also losing the warrior that's in, innately inside of them. Okay. So um, thank you for the opening because I've, okay, I have this big question. Let me see how to word it. But so you have limitations and we know there's so many men who are not happy with their intimacy or struggling with it or um, you know, I'm targeting married men, partnered men in this um, to women. And so what, what do you offer them? What, what do they say to you? Because you don't accept limitations, right? right. So ask the question slightly differently because I want to make sure I'm answering your question. I'm answering what I think you're asking. So men are overcoming. How do they overcome their own limitations their own limited thinking, their own limited not being happy, they're not experiencing uh, body connectedness, body intimacy, spiritual heart, um, all of the intimacy, but they, they may be complaining or, or stopping short and you don't stop there. <laughs> what, what do you tell them? What's your message? You can pick up on any of those threads. So, one of the things that's really important to talk to men who are um, not living authentically, and I want to be very clear about what I'm saying. That might sting a little when I say you're not being authentic. If you are not in your, the fullness of your power, the fullness of your um, expression and experience of who you are, then you are being inauthentic. My martial arts um, teacher in Japan um, talks about himself being extraordinary. Right? Not extraordinary, not better than, extraordinary. He'll say extraordinary, right? But he does it because it's a play on words, right? Be because when we are extraordinary, we are extraordinary human beings. And an extraordinary human being, an extraordinary man is not a man, he's a gentleman. He's not even a gentleman, he's a gentleman a warrior, right? And I'm not promoting war. I'm not promoting fighting. I'm promoting the courage and to stand in direct contrast to someone who might be harming your friends or your family right to stand up for what you believe in um and so one of the things that i tell these men who feel like they're not in their power is truthfully i'll ask them what's in your way what's holding you back what's going on in your mind because it's not inside of their body and part of that problem is they're not inside of their body right they're inside of their mind and I reference this as being the maze of the mind. You're, tra you're stuck, you're trapped. And so I'll ask them, well, where do you see that, that emotion, where do you feel that, what's going on in your, uh, in your mind? Well, what does that mean to you? So we're playing with the intellect a little bit, right? And when I say, well, where do you see that? You know, they'll tell me what they see. They'll, well, in my life, it's usually like this. This is 
this is where I see it. And I say, okay, but what right now do you see an image? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do you see it? Well, I see it in my head. Or I see it right here in front of my face. Often people say, I see it right here in front of my face. Sometimes people will point at their head and they'll say, well, you know, dude, it's my head. And um, I'll say, okay, but where is, where is your emotion? And they're like, uh, uh, I don't, what do you mean? I don't know what you mean. In my, in my heart? Question mark, right? So they don't know. So one of the things I do with them is I get them to shift from their head, the maze of the mind, into their body so that when they're in their body, they're like, okay, I feel solid. And I call it becoming the cowboy, right? Because um, when you're in your head, there's a lot of, it's convoluted, it's, you know, distracting, it's not authentic, I'm not being my true self because I'm not being full in my extra ordinariness. I'm not actually using um, my eyesight completely. I'm not listening as completely. I'm not tasting as, as fully. I'm not feeling physically or emotionally um, to the uh, complete range. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're using our senses, being aware of those senses, and that happens with being present in the being, present in the body. So you go from the head to the body, from the body to the heart, and from the heart back out of the body into the being, right? So we let them touch the heart, and then from there, we express out, so there's this feeling. And I talk about this as being the cowboy because I just have this archetype in my head of the, the quintessential cowboy who he works hard on the, you know, on the farm or on the ranch. You know, he puts in a long day's work of, uh, of labor, um, yet he's loving and kind and gentle to every woman he meets, whether it's a mother or a complete stranger. Tips his hat to the ladies, demonstrates a level of appreciation and gratitude for who they are. And so I get the men to regain and reclaim that inner cowboy. And then we, once he, he reclaims that inner cowboy, um, and some men would prefer like a Navy SEAL. That's fine. I start with cowboy, then I move, right? Um, but that's, that's what happens is I make sure it's not just inner, it's also now coming out. Remember I said head into the body, body into the heart, heart back to the body, and then into the being. Focus. Well, I like the cowboy because when I was very young, my role model, my so what I wanted to be and I thought was perfect, the woman was... Dale Evans. My mom too. <laughs> Love Roy Rogers too. Yeah, she was married to Roy Rogers, and she had this beautiful cowgirl outfit and these boots and a hat. I mean, she was a cowgirl, and she married to this cowboy that everybody knew, and it was just fantastic. And and so I love that you bring that up. And there's this um, there's this scene in Ellen. You know the TV show Ellen. Oh. Right? Yeah. Where, um, what's his name? Um, oh, I can't believe I'm going to forget his name. He's a, a pretty famous country singer. Um, one of the, the first when country started to become pop, not Clint Black, Garth Brooks. Ooh, he shoots, he shoots, he scores, the crowd goes wild. <laughs> okay, so Garth Brooks. And Garth Brooks is on there, and I can't remember exactly what happens, um, but I think somebody like pops out of a box to try to scare him. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't move. The person gets out and they start to stumble. He immediately gets up and walks over to make sure that they can help. Or something spills out or something. I forget exactly what happened, but something happens where he, in the middle of the interview, doesn't jump, doesn't start, gets up, walks over to see what he can do to help. Right? I was like, that is a good man. That is a good man. He didn't startle in the face of potential danger. He wasn't, you know, upset or angry that they tried to startle him or tease him. Right. He actually found, I think he found it somewhat, you know, humorous, but he also recognized that somebody was in need. And so without even saying, please excuse me, he like just did the right thing. Mm, right. Nice. That is so, and I had one of my clients watch it. I was like, watch this because I'm always making an effort to get him from out of his engineering brain into his cowboy body, into it, let me rephrase it, out of his engineering mind into his cowboy being. I like that and I like role models and I like visualizing and <clears throat> to hear and see, um, you know, who is it that, that represents because that, those are, are needed, in my opinion, by men. So I'm going to, now I'm going to 
meander a little bit differently. So we started, you started talking about getting a guy into his body and his heart. And so what are some of the words, the languaging that this cowboy actually says to his cowgirl that connects to her heart? I understand. How are you? Mm. It's not even always the words he uses. It's the way he touches her, the way he looks at her, the presence he is in with her. He's not distracted, right? He's very much with her. He's attentive. He's, if, he, she's, if he sees she's struggling, he, he goes to her, right? And if mm -hmm. he's busy and she comes to him and she's like, can you help me like, change this light bulb? And he's working on something. He put, puts down whatever he's doing, wipes off his hands. Right in my mind, I see this image of him working on the car, right? I, I'm not, and I'm not. I don't like to get greasy and dirty, so that's not even in my paradigm, right? But if I'm working, whatever I'm doing, I sit down. You know, we walk, wipe our hands. We walk over to our lady. Notice I haven't said anything yet, right? <clears throat> Touch her face, kiss her head. You know, then say, "Yeah, babe, do you need me to do it now, or would it be okay if I did it after I finish what I'm working on?" Usually women will say, no, it's, I thought maybe you could do it now, but it's okay. Like we can do it later. It's okay. It's not that important. Are you sure? Right? No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. She didn't really want something changed. The light bulb changed. She wanted to know that she still mattered in that moment. She was coming in just to get loved. Right? And so, like mm -hmm. you like that? Good, like good. That. So it's not, it's not always what we say as men. It's more what we do. Am I attentive? Am I listening? Right, but as far as saying, one of the things that women really like is, you know, well, tell me about your day, what happened? Women talk lots and lots and lots, way more than men. Maybe not more than me, but way more than men, right? Yeah. Um, but when, and men don't talk nearly as much. Again, I'm being very stereotypical because what we're seeing globally is a lot of boys that were raised, young men that were raised by women, and these young men are becoming amazing good guys who also are emotionally connected who are also um, communicating more fully and more richly and participating in, you know, the housework and the cleaning and the raising of the kids and all of this, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. So um, in terms of what he can say, when she says, well, what are you thinking about? Why are you so quiet? If he doesn't know, because we don't always, I was like, nothing, I don't know, nothing. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes we weren't really thinking of something. Sometimes we're like, I don't know, you know? So, but instead of saying nothing, because women hate that, because mm -hmm. women feel like, why are you holding back from me? Why aren't you sharing with me? Why aren't you connecting? All these crazy thoughts go through a woman's mind. So what a man can say is, wow, babe, I'm not sure I was thinking anything. Um, I think I was just watching the road as we were driving. I don't know, maybe I was talking about this or thinking about this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. So even if he doesn't know, notice I used more words. When a man uses more words with a woman, she feels like they're connecting. Mm -hmm. He uses fewer oh, words. Oh. Yeah. So, so now I want to ask, what is your definition of intimacy? Mm. Intimacy is the fullness and richness of connecting at the deepest levels emotionally. So I'm really sharing authentically what's going on for me. I'm scared right now or I'm excited right now. Um, the sharing of the physical touch, not just sex, but actual like holding hands, looking her in the eyes, touching her face, touching her hair, even laying your hand on her chest so she can feel the strength and the weight power of your masculinity, hugging her, holding her. Now, not everybody is physically touchy. Like, that's not everyone's love language to borrow from uh, the five love languages, right? But if you pay attention, then you know what she talks about. You know it's interesting and important for her. And you start to show that intimacy by doing for her or connecting with her in a way that is most important for her. And when you do that, the depth of that connection happens. So there's the five love languages and then Tony Robbins talks about the six basic human needs, which truthfully, I borrow those because they're quite- okay. so that, uh, Tony Robbins talks yeah. about- Tony Robbins talks about the six basic human needs. Um, and again, Please forgive this microphone. This is on my computer. This is not where I normally record. So this is just my regular computer where I work during the day. <clears throat> um, so 
Tony Robbins talks about the six basic human needs. And um, so let me explain two things about both of these. Tony will talk about if you can talk, if you can get identify what the top two um, of their human needs are, the top two of their six basic human needs, um, and you can do three, you're even better. But if you can do two, um, you'll probably keep them forever and not have any problems. If you can do three in the order and in the amounts that they need, like one might need 45% and another might need 35% and another might need 12%, you know? So if you can really make sure that you're giving lots of this first one, some of the second one, it, it, and it's, it's an art, it's an art. And that takes listening, it takes watching, it takes observing, it takes testing and trial and error. And once you figure it out and asking, like babe, when I did this, how did that make you feel? Versus this, which did you prefer? Oh, I really like this one better, mm. right? Then I'll make sure that I communicate with that way. Nice. Aww. One of the most beautiful things. So continuing on this idea of, of what um, <clears throat> what my definition of intimacy is, when you do that, you're communicating in a way that their brain and their body and their being and their heart and emotional body and their soul is open and receptive. <clears throat> and so if we stay with the physical, if we move, if we now shift into the physical intimacy, a woman's body is open and receptive to the male's body. And when that's the case, um, and she is open and receptive, then um, there's a softness there. Mm -hmm. But when she's not, she's shut down and there's a tension there that doesn't work. And so, <clears throat> please forgive me, I'm uh, a little congested today. There's a, and we want that softness and that openness and receptivity. So when we connect with them emotionally, then we're connecting with them intimately. And then they feel like we understand them. Women just want to be understood. When they're understood, <clears throat> and they're understood, understood, there's a great level of appreciation, and women become incredibly loyal. Mm -hmm. women understood, women connected with. So, um, there's one last thing that I want to say, and I don't know who, who said this, but it's an amazing quote. I wish I'd said it. Boys make their girls jealous. Real men make their ladies, friends jealous. Boys make their girls jealous. Real men, and dare I even say gentlemen warriors, gentlemen make their ladies, friends jealous. So all of their friends are like, oh my God, he's so amazing. I wish I could find somebody like that. <laughs> and we want to be that kind of man. We want to be the kind of man who goes to our woman and says, can I talk to you? And she says, oh my God, what? Are, is there another woman are breaking up, right? And this is just the very first time, right? And we say, no, babe, then I want to just, I want to try and be courageous in a way that I'm not normally courageous. I want to apologize. I haven't been there for you. She will melt. Here's what I think you needed. Here's what I think you were asking for. Here's how I reacted. I didn't respond in the way that makes me happy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I wasn't a good man for you in that moment. I want to be your man. I want to be the best man I can for you. Would you please stay patient with me and help me understand how I can be better for you? She'll do anything for him. If a man does a little for his woman, she'll do everything for him. Mm -hmm. wow. wow. That's so powerful. How did you get so wise? Thank you for the compliment. I don't know. I think I just love and care. And I genuinely want people to be, to have love. I want people to feel like their life is vacation. And think about when we're on vacation, but we fall in love. Even if we're not in a relationship, we meet somebody like, oh my God, I can tell you I love them forever. Right? Because we're not stressed. We're not being torn in a multitude of different directions. We're present. When we're present, connection occurs. And we all want that connection because that's the life force of humanity. Mm -hmm. So when have you been in love on a three-dimensional level? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you my favorite story. Okay. okay. Um, because it's so unusual for other people. Um, I was in third grade and um, I was walking down the hall of my third grade 
of my school. And I was on like, I was on the left side. So as if I was driving in Japan, right? I was on the left side and I looked diagonally across just as I was about to go into my classroom. I looked diagonally across about, I think maybe 50 feet away, maybe not quite that much, but you know, you're little and things seem really big. Um, and so I looked diagonally across and just as I was getting ready to go into my classroom, I saw, and I can even feel it today. I saw this beautiful little second grade girl, right? And she didn't see me. I saw her, I'm almost in tears. And um, we both went to our classroom and I felt something I never felt before. And um, mm -hmm. you know, I sat down and like a third grade little boy, I forgot, promptly forgot about her. Um, and then I saw her again in the fifth grade. I got out of class to go to the bathroom. And this was back when classrooms had half walls or no walls or, you know, they're really open classrooms. So you could hear like three different teachers simultaneously. And so I got out of the class to go to the bathroom and just happened to look in a classroom, just pure curiosity. And I looked in, she was sitting right in the middle of the class and I couldn't see her face. I could just see like diagonally. So you a little, a little part of her cheek, a little part of her nose. And I immediately knew it was the same little girl. And again, my heart just went pitter patter, pitter patter. And every single day I try to go to the bathroom at least once, if not twice, because mm -hmm. I just wanted to walk by and see her and just to, just to drink in mm -hmm. beauty and not just the physical beauty. There was something there I was drinking in. There was a connection there that I desperately wanted. <clears throat> I didn't see her again until I was a sophomore in high school and she was a freshman. <clears throat> And this is where the story is less than beautiful. Um, There's a little bit of background noise, by the way. I just don't want to miss anything. I'm, just, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'll talk a little louder. The background noise is actually birds. Oh, right. that's what it sounded like. Yes. Wow. Oh. Yeah, I have uh, quite the... Um, the birds are attracted to my backyard for whatever reason. So I'll talk just a little bit louder. So here's, here's where men should really listen. I was no longer the man that I could have been or should have been. I was, you know, I was nice, I was friendly, and then one day I was weird. Typical teenage weird boy stuff because I didn't know how to talk to her. So I would talk to her and then we would be friends and the next day I'd be weird and then I'd be nice again and then I'd, we, I'd get a phone number and I'd call and we'd chat for a little because she was polite and I was awkward and didn't know what to say. And oh, eek, it was so embarrassing and terrible. It's terrible, right? I mean, literally, there were times when we'd be <clears throat> sitting in the hallway at um, like a drama uh, class in the evening, and she'd be crying and talking to me, and I would be able to be there for her. And other days where I would be saying random weird stuff, not like, not mean or cruel, never mean and cruel, never. Um, just like awkward, like trying to get her attention, you know, these kinds of things, like mm -hmm. trying to make myself cooler or bigger, better, and smarter than, mm -hmm. than everybody else. And so um, I, as the story progresses, you know, I graduated and went on and we didn't get together. In fact, we never got together. However, um, I started to develop this sense in college where if someone would, um, if someone would pop into my mind um, that I wasn't consciously, intentionally thinking about, they would just pop into my mind. Two or three days later, I would see them mm -hmm. or they would call. <clears throat> and so um, when, no, can you hear the birds are quiet now? There's right. a cat out there, right? So they're like, <gasps> you know, so um, after I graduated, and this just became more and more and more prominent. So literally I would be like, oh, I'm going to see this person within the next two or three days. Well, how do you, you know you're not, when are you going to see them? I'm like, I don't know, but I am. And I would. Mm -hmm. And so after I graduated, um, I was living out, I moved back um, in my mom's home for a little while. I went back to um, uh, the country and I, it was a bad move, not because I was with my mom, but because I was in the country and I wasn't able to really chase down a career after that. <clears throat> not while I was there, so I, had to, I wound up moving. But anyway, the point is, I started working um, at a restaurant, just doing like seating and host work and stuff like that, just to put some money in my pocket until I could figure out like what I was going to do um, to be able to like move on with my life. And, um, and I thought about her and I hadn't thought about her in a couple of years because none of my friends went out with her and none of my friends really knew her. 
And so I just, she just sort of slipped away and she popped into my head and immediately I was like, oh no, oh, I don't want to start feeling those feelings again where I don't know whether I'm coming or going. It's just terrible. And um, so two days go by, nothing. Three days go by, nothing. Two weeks, nothing. Three weeks, nothing. Two and a half months. True story. Two and a half months. And she comes walking along the building. I, I'm sitting there doing whatever I'm doing. And I, I have the sense. I look up and I look right at her. Right? I just like, boom. Like, I look right at her. She's walking along the, the side of the um, the restaurant with uh, somebody else I had gone to high school with. And um, as she started to get closer, my heart started to beat fast and excited to see her, but nervous because I know how awkward I was in high school and I'm not that same awkward guy. And eek, am I going to make her uncomfortable? Because I desperately don't want to make her uncomfortable. And she came in and I was just like, all of that washed away. And I immediately realized, and this is an important uh, moment, I immediately realized that the love that I had for her was something that I was trying to take and get for myself. And the love that I had for her now in this moment, right, the, the love that I was currently experiencing was like, how are you? Are you okay? It was giving. I had shifted in my maturity from wanting, trying to take and get her attention, you know, and be the guy in her life instead of wanting to know if she was okay and being the guy who might be able to provide something for her. And mm -hmm. she came in two or three days after that. When she came back in, you know, everything was fine. There wasn't an awkwardness about mm -hmm. it. Um, and I emailed her one time when Facebook first came out. <clears throat> I Facebooked her and just said, hey, look, I just wanted to apologize for how awkward I was in high school. Um, I never got a chance to apologize and I really would love to have apologized to you. I didn't mean to be weird. It just, I was just this weird boy that was just captivated by you and didn't know how to talk to girls. And um, I said, at the end, I said, please don't friend me if there's any um, concern or fear or discomfort um, in your life right now. I know you're married and you have children. I want to make sure that's beautiful and everything is good. I'm not here to, to cause any problems. I just want you to know that I'm sorry. And I really appreciate how graceful you were always with me because she was, she was never angry with me. She was always kind, you know? And so while that may not be the love story that you're looking for, it's one of the greatest love stories of my life because it started purely by innocence. It started by a recognition, like I knew her. And I still believe right now at this age, I still believe I know her. Like I know her, I believe we were connected in the past, in a previous life. Mm -hmm. We partners, you know. Um, and in this life, I get to just love her. This is a beautiful love story. This is better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So it, it didn't incorporate the physical intimacy. It didn't incorporate even the emotional intimacy, but it incorporated the vulnerability, which I think is really important because mm -hmm. part of intimacy is being courageous enough to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And not all men are that in that space. And that's what causes the separation between them and the woman that they're with. They're not courageous enough to be vulnerable. One of the things that I, I when I teach men and women collectively, <clears throat> I say, ladies, have you ever had a man walk up behind you? And as he walks up behind you, he embraces you from behind. And as he embraces you from behind, not like he doesn't sneak up on you and scare you, but you know he's, he's approaching you and he's somebody that you're comfortable with, a partner. It could even be a dad. There's a sweetness to it with a dad too. But your, your lover, your partner walks up behind you. He embraces, excuse me, he embraces you from behind. What do you naturally do? You go, <sighs> why? Because you're breathing in the naturalness and the connection and washing out all of the, I have got to watch my own back. So you're releasing all the masculine so your natural feminine can come out and you can receive openly and easily and receptively. Um, I know receive and receptive are the same thing, but it just, so you can you know, receive receptively. It feels like it needs to be said. Um, so you can be receptive, let me say it that way. Mm -hmm. So you can be receptive in this beautiful way. But what's going on is that when the man embraces you from behind, He's not verbally saying, I've got your back. I've got your back, babe. So you don't have to watch your back. You just take care of 
what's in front of you and I'll take care of back here to keep you safe. But that, while it's beautiful when a woman comes up and hugs her man from behind and it basically says, I support you and I love you and I appreciate you and you're strong and I know that you can support me. <clears throat> when a woman embraces a man from the front and really like lovingly nurturing embraces him from the front, especially when she can see that he's vulnerable, especially when she can see that he's weak or struggling with something, even if he hasn't said it, what happens is she's saying, I've got your heart. I know you're scared to be vulnerable, but with me, I'll protect you. This is the woman's job is to protect the man's vulnerability, to protect his heart. We don't share with other people. So the more you're able to be present and listen and give him space to think and articulate at his speed and not ever judge him or tell him what to do, what happens is he realizes you're the one woman in his life he can trust and he'll share more and more with you. And if he shares, and you embrace him, you'll hold him, you're close with him, right? And now again, I understand five love languages. Some people may not be connected mm -hmm. to that kind of connection. But as long as you're metaphorically and in many cases physically hugging him from the front, embracing that space, that heart, you're saying, I protect your heart from that vulnerability. You will only be vulnerable inside of me. Listen to that. It's very sexual, very intimate. You will only be vulnerable inside of me. Mm -hmm. will protect you, nurture you, and embrace you while you're vulnerable. And then beyond that, I know mm -hmm. that you will protect and watch over me. Mm -hmm. That is beautiful. That, that is um, such an elaboration of what I consider the first stage of physical intimacy. I happen to have five stages. I'd love to hear them. Can you share them with me? Yeah, sure. I'd love to hear them. Okay. So the first one is um, the love lingo. What is her love lingo? You can look at love languages. That's, that's a great tool. Huh. Um, what does she have to have, you know, the do or dies? What does she have to have from you? Uh, and you, you as well, so you can exchange that. And setting the atmosphere, what are the scents that she likes? What is, what's the ambience, the lighting, the, the type of what she considers romantic in the bedroom, in the living room? eating, um, you know, if I show up right at the time she's got dinner ready or, or I prepared to, you know, all of that kind of goes into what's the stage setting and the inviting. What does she like? Oh, she doesn't like that I like a couple of screens on. Um, she's really got to have it that I'm, I'm settled. I've spent a couple minutes before I got into the house from work and I'm opening list, I'm in a new space, you know. I'm, I'm not using the harsh language. I'm not going to pick up on somebody else's conversation. I'm giving her eye contact. When I walk into this, she gets it, even though the rest of the family or more people are there, she gets it first. She's a, so it, it's, it's called, to me, it's the ambiance and it's really setting the invitingness. Uh, the second stage for me is rituals and yeah. And it's amazing at times when I've come across couples who don't, or guys that don't, maybe they even have a ritual and they don't know that's what it is. We lie next to each other and we, um, we giggle or we, we have a joke. We like to start with this. We have a little symbol. Uh, as soon as I put this here, that's the, or I start flirting or I, that's my, my next symbol for even getting closer to the bedroom or just that we're going to have a cup of tea together, a glass of wine together. Um, maybe we do yoga once a, once a week. Maybe we meditate. Uh, we swim together. We walk every day for a few. Each night we check in with each other and there's beautiful rituals around making that simple. We breathe together. Even if we can't do anything else, we just come in for a moment and say, what a nice moment. And the kids are driving us up. Okay. So rituals and there's a meal. How many people don't eat together? You know? And so the third one is the non -phys non sexual and non but sensual. It can be um, it can be just touch that is not sexual. So there's no nipples, there's no pussy, there's no penis. It's touching the other parts of the body, and it doesn't convey sexuality. Now that gets a little tricky because it can get into sensual. 
because it can also include spooning, which is sensual, and things that connect and get a person to that level. So uh, sometimes I have guys that really struggle with that and how long that can take and how much a woman loves that. Can I, can I add to this real quick? Please. The men, the men are struggling here because they're still taking. Okay, remember when I talked about the cowboy, right? And the thing I didn't say is that often the, when you're in the mind, you're more of a vampire. You're more taking, right? And so the men that struggle are because they're trying to get for themselves instead of saying, hey, I'm actually here to nurture my lady. This is about her, and I just get to feel the, the, the benefit of giving to her, right? So he's not receiving. Spot on. He to get. Mm. Mm, yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted. Oh, to... that's great, and it's so helpful because I will get comments. Well, when am I going to get what I want? When am, you know, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> and trying to you know, like you're saying. Um, because then it's not authentic, mm-hmm. and no woman wants that. Don't snuggle with me if all you want is sex, right? They, because that's not what it's about for me. Snuggle yeah. with me because you want to snuggle with me. Snuggle with me because you want to give to me. Snuggle with me because you want to connect with me, mm. right? And then. Almost by default, women will just become physically intimate also. Not always, right? But if he's doing it for the wrong reasons, he's not authentic. And people want to be like, well, no, that's very authentic for a man. Yes. Boy, you're really sexy. Oh, thank you. You've got these beautiful ideas. You've got it. So um, it may not have to go any further than touch, you know, because that's the other misperception of body intimacy. Has to has to result in a certain an orgasm. It's got to have pen, penetrate. It's yeah. So my my fourth stage is direct sexual contact, and this is readied by the previous stages. And it's it's not exactly linear, but I do find men like structure. And but it's good to understand that because she might need me to go back to stage three. She might want to go back to a breath strat. Uh, approach and and stage two she might like some little ritual we do where we do it together um and so this being very sensual sexual in the fourth stage often is accompanied by orgasm it can be hand sex it can be mutual masturbate it can be a man bringing her to her joy and her ecstasy but that needs to get to a nine or 10 generally, because if you do move to penetration, which you don't need to, but if you do, it's better for, a, it's best for a woman uh, if she's at a nine or 10 in stage four. So that's sort of a summary. Thank you so much. for. Yeah, can I add to that too? Please add anything. Okay, so look, if we wanna um, nurture our partner to that nine or 10, so she then becomes open and receptive, right, for the, in, for the intercourse. Um, men often don't last as long um, as a woman takes to have an orgasm. And so what we're doing <clears throat> is we're creating the opportunity to come together. We're creating the opportunity to have that physical intimacy together because she's at a nine or a 10, she's open and receptive and ready for that physical intimacy. And so when he enters, now they're both um, at a higher stimulation. One of the problems with men is that when they eat, they gulp, they forget to taste, right? And so there are three kinds of, they, chefs um, will often talk about, and people that are food critics, <clears throat> excuse me, will often talk about, there are three kinds of tasters. There's the gulper, which most men are. There's the taster, and somebody goes, oh, that tastes really good. Then there's the super taster, which chefs are tend to be, and more women than men are, right? This uh, subtlety of the palate. So if we go back to, to the bedroom for a moment, um, then the problem is if men are golfers at the table, mm-hmm. right? They're probably going to just be thinking about the ejaculation, the, the physical orgasm, versus like the taste along the way. What does this feel like along the way? Wow, that feels really nice, right? They're like, oh, that feels really nice. Let's go to the coming. Mm, that's, that just feels nice. Mm-hmm. And relax and allow themselves to be in that present moment of how does it feel to give? How does it feel to watch her receive? How does it feel to know that she's receiving 
openly and you're able to just pour into her? How does it feel when she touches you, right? That feels good. And do you want, if that feels good, why do you want it to be over so quickly? Mm -hmm. So ask yourself as a man, why do you want it to be over so quickly? And I can hear some of the men on the other line, on the other side going, I don't, I don't want it to go over quickly. I want it to go longer. I don't know how to do anything about that. (laughs) Slow down. Start start with your food. Start with your eating. Start with the way you walk. Are you walking mindfully? Start learning um, to do walking meditation. Slow down when you eat. Turn off all the screens, like Nancy said. Turn off all the screens and um, eat slowly. After you take a bite, put your fork down. And chew it, taste it, smell it, look at it. And then as you do that, these kinds of things start being more attentive to the physical touch of things. What do your clothes feel like on you right now? When you reach for something, what is the texture of that? Mm-hmm. For example, my sister, she'll walk around a clothing rack and she'll feel, 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 oh, that feels good. And then she'll pull it out and look if she likes the design and the color and if it's in her size. And if it doesn't feel good, she's not going to pull it out. Mm-hmm. So men can pause and like start to feel things. What does my desk feel like right now? What does the steering wheel feel like? And when they start doing that, that will translate into being slower and more aware in the bedroom instead of going right to the golfing and the coming. Mm, wow. So you mentioned something about walking. <laughs> what, what is it that men walk ahead of their women? <clears throat> now, not at all, but, but I, we've seen this, right? What's... It's impatience. It's I'm on a mission and men move together right? Um, But we move together because we're on a mission together. And women like to meander and they like to just witness and experience life. See, the difference is this. Men move through life. Women are moved through life. Mm -hmm. And so a man goes, that's what I want and go for it and done. And then I can go back to just being, you know, uh, conserving my energy. Because um, a man usually expresses a lot of energy quickly in a fight or, you know, um, it'll be prolonged over the hunt, for example. Um, but there's a heightened state of awareness and potential aggression um, if, they're, if they're, like, trying to kill something so that they can eat. <clears throat> now, we can, you know, that's a whole other philosophical conversation about calming down when you're hunting and things like that. Different story. Women are moved through life, right? So where men move through life, and they're like, that's what I want, and they move through it, and they push things out of their way. They're sort of like a bull in a china shop sometimes. But let me rephrase. The masculine can, okay? So instead of stereotyping, the masculine can move through space like a bull in a china shop. Mm. It's not necessarily the healthy masculine. It's an unaware masculine. But, and let me rephrase this, and quite the opposite, and even though I said it's a compliment, Quite the opposite of the bull in the china shop, unaware masculine. Um, there's also a very aware, gentlemanly masculine, but quite the opposite of uh, the bull in the china shop masculine is the woman who is very aware and very present and very extraordinary, where all of her senses are turned on. So when she walks and she's moved through life, she's not in a hurry because she doesn't want to miss things. She's feeling the sun on her skin. She's smelling the amazing flower in the air that her man might not even smell, right? She's looking at the colors. She's watching the interaction between moms and their children walking out to the car. You know, she is wanting to connect even though they're walking and going somewhere together on a, in the man's mind, a mission. Like, we're going in here to eat. Come on, let's go. We're going in here to grab this thing. Let's get it and, get, and go home, right? Whereas she just wants to be in the experience. And so men, mm. they're not, the, the problem is they're not on the same mission. So one of the things that I do when I'm coaching couples <clears throat> is, and even if I'm just coaching a, a woman or just coaching a man, one of the things that I encourage is to go for walks together. And when you walk together, I encourage you, if you really want to make a connection, to do what I call pacing, right? Now, in neurolinguistic programming, pacing is something slightly different but it's related enough that it's acceptable in, in this definition. When she steps with her left, you step with your left. When she steps with her right, you step with your right. And then what happens is 
um, psychologically, we are facing the same direction, right? So we're seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Psychologically, we're moving in the same direction. So we're not just facing, but we're moving out there in the same direction. So we're advancing into our future together. Psychologically, again, we're moving at the same speed. So I'm not leaving you behind and creating a disconnect. I'm saying, I want to be connected with you. And if the man needs to go a little faster when he paces with her, he just slowly goes a little faster because he's already paced with her because he already has that connection. She'll speed up just a little because she wants to be with him. But if he goes too fast, then he's only thinking about thinking about him instead of making, maintaining that connection with her. Um, and so, again, if we're moving, if we're facing the same direction, we're moving the same, we're moving the same speed, we're moving in the same direction, we also probably have the same end goal. We're going to walk out here, we're going to probably go a mile, two miles, maybe five miles if you're really, you know, uh, athletic and feeling comfortable or just meandering. You're going to go out, you're going to turn around and come back. Even if you don't know we're only going to go this far or we're going to walk all the way around the block, even if you don't know that, you just trust that you're going to get out there somewhere together and at some point you'll turn around and come back together. Mm -hmm. but the thing is that you're not just psychologically aligning, but you're biochemically and energetically also aligning because your brains start to um, be coherent. Your heart starts to be coherent with your own brain. Your heart and your brain and your energy starts to be coherent with the heart and brain and the energy of your partner. And then all of this is together, you know, moving together, facing the same direction, same vision, same intention, turn around and coming back. You're not alone in this world. And that's evidence and proof that you're with your partner. Mm -hmm. And this starts by pacing, not walking ahead of, mm -hmm. not being like, oh my God, come on. Because then you're seen as a burden. And men that do that aren't really in a space. Remember I said, they're taking for granted. They're not appreciative of their lady. Men, gentlemen who are appreciative walk with their lady. And even if they say, hey, babe, can we go a little bit, you know, can we move a little quicker? Because I want to be able to get in and get back to this place by. Then she goes, yeah, 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 I'm totally in support. She just needs to know what the plan is. Women are absolutely, almost always, willing to be led by a good man Right, and so if he says, I, "It would it be okay if we make this pretty quick, because I'd love to be able to do A, B, or C after this," then she knows what the plan is, and she goes, "Sure, I'm on board." And if not, she goes, "Well, I was hoping we could also do this." And a good man says, "Yeah, of course, baby, we can do that too." And then they can discuss what comes first or second. But in the meantime, let's get this done and out of the way so we can go do this fun stuff. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'm I'm a ten of the time. Oh, okay. And I had an idea because <laughs> right. you were so generous to book two different time slots with me. And today is, was supposed to be just a free fun chatting. Yeah. I thought I'd, I'd record both of these, keep both of these and offer both of this one and the next one as a, this one as a bonus, I guess, because we're just kind of having fun chat time. Is there um, something you want to, to ask me um, on or off recording or uh, before? I just wanted to know more about you. Like, how did you get into psychology? Why did you get into psychology? Um, <laughs> what is it that you love about psychology? Um, where is your heart? Like, I wanted to know truthfully, I wanted to feel this. I hope that this sounds okay. I wanted to feel you. Oh, no, that's I wanted, to, I wanted to come into your heart. I wanted to feel your heart. And find out who is this woman who yeah. wants to um, help men that are struggling become better men for their ladies, so mm -hmm. everybody is happier. Because I don't, I don't think that we need as many separations and divorces as we have. Mm -hmm. I think that we could really repair most of the relationships around the world with mm -hmm. a little bit of understanding and patience. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, well, I'll, I'll go ahead, but um, how much time do you have? Do you have more than um, five minutes? Or what time? What time? Well, we are probably at your hour, so you have to tell I've me. I've got a little bit more time. Yeah. Okay. I'll yeah. try to make it. <laughs> no, take your time. Okay. okay. We're good. <laughs> well, I was an exchange student to Brazil in 1967. Uh, Kennedy, President Kennedy, had set up uh, a partnership between us and South America and uh -huh. Brazil and uh, partners to the uh, you know our neighbors to the south, sisters, brothers, 
and um, I enjoyed that experience so much that when I came, by the way, I fell in love there. Oh, I love it. I'd love to hear that story too. So I think we got time for both. <laughs> so um, I didn't know then how to continue along. To, I wouldn't have known how to do that. So I <laughs> didn't, but I remember the feeling kind of like you were explaining yours. It was so special. So, um, and he was in medical school at the time and I was in high school. Anyway, um, so when I came back, I knew that I, I enjoyed the cultural experience. You know, I, I met um, a communist, you know, and I'm, I'm like, <laughs> that was a big deal. But I yeah, saw, this is right, for sure. Yeah, and I saw written uh, Yankee Go Home, you know, all, all this interesting, to me it was interesting. Yeah. So I knew that I wanted to go into the Foreign Service when I came back. So um, in my um, orientation weekend for, for entering college at the University of Maryland, huh? um, I ended up in a group of, of men, they were boys to me, they weren't mature. Right, right, right. But they were, the, they weren't my group, they weren't my God, they weren't my peoples. <laughs> right, right, right. And, I, and at that time, the School of Business at the University of Maryland is not what it is now, it's like competes with Harvard's so, you know, business school. Okay, so um, I had this wonderful counselor, I said, I don't belong in this group, help, you know, get me, um, somehow, which is unusual because I was uh, a, a very much an introvert, shy, but but I loved learning. So, and I was finally in my element out of um, high school, which was so painful for me and feeling judged and not fitting in. So, he spent the whole weekend. What do you What are you interested? You know, and I kept coming back to people. I'm interested in people, and he said. And I also had an interest in uh, pre, in medical and pre, in psychiatry and pre med. So he said, "Okay, basically you're going to you're going to major in pre med, and psychology is going to be your concentration, and so you can pick what you want when you get out." And so that was the beginning. And I knew right away if I stay with psychology, you have to have a finishing degree. So I knew me. I knew that I was going to go psychology because I couldn't quite handle the rigor of the ologies and the intensity of what, and I, you know, and I didn't even know about emotional support back then. <laughs> you know, so, I don't know if any of us did. <laughs> right. And to get through that in any of that as a woman back then, there were, anyway. So, and then I found out the first semester, I found out immediately I'd have to have the finishing degree of PhD. And I remember being anxious, anxiety, not being able to sleep, go to the counseling center. So I have this probably a PhD candidate practicing listening to me that I want to get my PhD in psychology. And he says to me, you worry too much. Mm. So, and I didn't even know what that meant. I just know I left there and I guess I was written off as my problems aren't serious enough so they wouldn't set me up with another one. And so, um, so I stayed the line and I knew I was very clear on this as my major. Now I got sidetracked because my mentor there was a woman head of the uh, medical center on campus, Dr. Bird. And this was this beautiful uh, physician, an MD, long gray ponytail. And she wasn't, she could talk about sex, birth control, I mean, anything. Cause she'd come to these talks, these presentations, people were trying to get her into classes cause she was so daggone good. And I went, that's <clears throat> what I wanna do. I wanna run a women's uh, program, a, a women's health center because that had a voice that it just started women women's health was a new voice and um i started into that major in medical in um, graduate school in health education and then i got married and i, I didn't have a partner who could uh, understand the rigor of studying and research and what that took so i didn't make it in that got diverted, um, did have a couple of kids, uh, adopted a daughter later on on my own. But in, so in that travels, I was still searching to get my degrees. So I got an MA uh, finally, um, and then I uh, had, um, had a, kind of delayed getting the PhD. And then by the time I went for it, I had to get, a, get an MS because I didn't have an uh, empirical piece of research in the MA and um, continued on and just continued working at the same, doing everything, you know, did too much. And so, and 
I just continued um, seeking in my concentration in my PhD. I went to Howard University, which is a black university in DC. Uh, and I probably had more freedom to pick what my personality concentration was going to be. And it was in Carl Jung. So I'm very Jungian and I uh, yeah, very much believe in um, the project. Yep, yep. And um, that everything is here to catalyze and transform us. Mm -hmm. And that we're here for a much bigger purpose. That, and so we precede our physical body when we come into any space anyway. So, um, and I've worked in the prison system for 12 and a half years. I've worked in profit, uh, non -profit. I've worked on a lot of nonprofit county, state, federal level jobs, and um, had my private practice and have worked with um, really, it isn't an age group so much as because my youngest have been tiny, two and three year olds all the way up to 70, 80. Um, it's unusual clients <laughs> that I work with. And I'm working less and less, uh, not so much concentrated on a, on a weekly anymore. I'm doing a little more of a consultation because I like to jam in a lot. <laughs> I like to give people a plan and get them to get themselves uh, with an accountability person, I call it, so that they're not dependent on me and that they can launch themselves. Um, so gosh, did, okay. So now, personally, I've been through failed relationships two divorces, and uh, tons of dating in the last two decades, probably met 100 men. And I started with, oh, what's in it for, or, you know, what's he like, what, you know, is he a good one? Is he, to transitioning to what can I bring to him? How can I, I'm scared of coming to meet someone for the, how can I make him feel better? He's going to be scared. What can I do to, for helping him? Uh, become this person he what is it I can do to provide and, and give and so I, I felt so much for men and of course I've had experience of my boundaries invaded from the time I was tiny uh, my last big explosive experience was 25 years ago that's when I changed my name and my last name became Moonstar it was like an atomic explosion it was at work and um, I write about it. It's on my website and it's in a couple of places. And um, I've always been a seeker. So how can I use this to make myself and others bigger and, and the world a better place? That's a little corny. But, and so my recent trek has been to help men. I, I had come up with these stages and, and I really felt called to advocate for men and my heart reaching out to them and especially in the me movement and the times movement I thought guys are at a, at a disadvantage if, if the gals can't tell them what they want, what their boundaries are. And so how does, how do I help men? How do we help men get women to do that more and to make things clear? And that's really at the bottom, I think of the drama and it's blowing up all over the planet. It's not just in this country. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that's, that's how I stepped into this. And uh, thank you so much. So, so let me ask uh, some questions. Um, let me say, I want it to come through me instead of from me. Okay. Because there, you said a lot that I wanted to like jump in and be like, okay, let, 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 let me ask you a question about this, you know? Um, so what I'm trying to do is I'm watching the, this story again, and I'm looking for the pieces where I wanted to ask. Um, okay, so starting in the psychology, right? When you're like, I, I wanna help people, and I knew that I wanted to uh, do psychology, and um, you didn't wanna deal with the rigors of the ologies. Um, what was it specifically, though, about psychology that made you go, this is like fascinating, and was it just like, it was in your head? Did you feel it in your head? And you no. were just like, oh, it's, I'm just intellectually stimulated. This is wonderful. I love to study. Or was there something that was bodily, like, well, wow, I'm drinking this in. Like, I want to know more. I noticed in high school, I, mm. I, had got, I was wondering, why is it that I want to understand others so deeply? What is it? And what answer I got was it helps me to understand myself. Yeah. 
And so that was probably carried into college and it was a perfect partnership to study the individual mind, body, soul, spirit, you know, beingness for me because sociology is talking about groups and anthropology. I love Margaret Mead um, is really sort of a mm-hmm. lineage, more lineage and, and groups and art, you know, meeting with um, influences. They all cross over. And, and there's a beautiful exhibit in the Smithsonian about bones and studying bones and going back and reconstructing people in, in primitive times and what they really, anyway, I find that fascinating too. And what they, you know, and their utensils tell you about how their life was. That's, but it was the individual and connecting and really understanding people that just continued. And of course, that's very Jungian. Carl Jung talked about anybody is reflecting back to us a piece of ourself and well, why, but what about what did you want to do with that like how did you want to help people why did you want to help people well it felt good, good to help people and um i guess i wasn't a receiver either mm. as much so you know i could give and it felt great to to know that i was helping a lot of people i remember working on my uh, phd and an inmate said to me while I was working on the, he said, oh, I see you helping tons of people and nothing could have been a bigger excitement to me. I was just like, I was just like taking that in, like, that's all I would want to do is help like gobs of people, tons of people. I can't think of any greater enjoyment. And um, so, you know, that, that catalyzes me and then overcoming my boundary invasions and the shocks of my life and then helping others get through those and overcome so i found that through the depths of emotional expression and experience i can not only take what i've gained from that and but i can help others overcome so helping others overcome adversity blocks challenges moving into the depths of their emotional experience because psychology is is using the emotional experience whereas um there are a lot of people who use different modalities that are that are similar but they use energy they use more of a spiritual more of an essence of the being and um, so mine is more of let's let's use emotions because you know, probably because I've had to learn to get in touch with them and feel and have emotions. And so when you touched on the emotions and the emotional language, you know, and we're not encouraged in our culture to, you know, talk, we're given lip service about, oh yeah, we're relationship oriented or we want to hear your feelings, but uh, yeah. So you get what I'm saying. So when, um, Let me ask it differently. How or what does it take? What did it take? And how did you go from having your boundaries violated um, to having compassion for men and wanting to help them? How does someone make that shift? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me think. Because there may be men in the past, if, if we're sharing this whole piece, with them. Um, there may be men that are listening who go, I can't forgive myself for some of this stuff that I've done. And so there's not space for them to become intimate with another woman because of the things that they've done. And yet we can't hold ourselves accountable today for what we did two years ago or 10 years ago, or when we were 10, right? We can look at it and go, if I took who I am today and placed it back in that 14 year old body, would I do that again? And if the overwhelming sense inside of us is no chance, I would never do that again. But there's no way for me to take that back or to remedy that or write that so they don't forgive themselves. So how is it that you were able to forgive them, I presume, Mm -hmm. um, and then create? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well. And what advice do you have for them? Okay. Okay. So so it's it's a nonlinear path for me because I thought I had healed a lot, but at about age 35, a girlfriend of mine noticed my hostility towards a man. Oh, okay. And she said, <clears throat> have you been violated? Have you been, a, a, you know, she asked me the right questions. And I said, yeah, when I was tiny, a male babysitter. And 
Um, and then she proceeded to, and I trusted her and she was the first woman. She's really how I learned to talk at an emotional develop an emotional relationship with others. And really? She, okay. Yeah, yeah. And this was in college. So and she created the space for you to begin to touch those emotions? Uh, touch them. And we continued our, we're still, we're still friends on Facebook. And, um, she asking these questions got me to realize I hadn't healed something that had happened 30 years prior. And that was the beginning. Now there were other, there were other events since then. So I wasn't dealing with all of it. Let's say I, I dealt with, and I, through for, fortunate ser as serendipity happens, um, I was able to, to have a, a, a minister pay for tr um, psychodrama for me to get through that. And so that was beautiful because I completed almost all of it, but it wasn't until my last big explosion with that 25 years ago that a psychologist helped me finish the last, they call them flashbacks, but it would be a vision of it coming when I was sleep, trying to sleep. And he really used a, be uh, a beautiful hypnotic approach to get me to keep going with it, deal with, stay with that vision, and then had me empower myself through a new vision, what I would do, and to practice that at night. And after a couple nights of it, I, I never even needed it again. It had replaced the old thought. So, and, and I have techniques that I've given to others that combine what I've learned, even newer uh, additional ones, but basically it's meeting the experience. So that's a short clip. Now, um, to men, anyone who has violated someone, who has hurt, harmed, the first question I come with is what help are you offering to maintain that guilt, that shame? Who in the hell are you helping by carrying that? It doesn't help anyone. It, well, what, if the, what if the response is, okay, what if the, the reaction in them is, um, yeah, but I don't deserve to be loved. I don't deserve to be in a relationship. I'm not good enough. I made these mistakes, right? They're, they resist your um, appeal to, are you helping anybody? And they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about what they don't deserve. So that would be good self-awareness that yeah. they know that. And I would, and I would tell you at this moment, any man listening, good, start there. And it is a process. And the first step I think about is, is starting to move the shame is to not make it a secret because it's very shame based. So it holds you back, it holds you back from giving your gifts. It holds you back from helping others, assisting others and contributing to the cosmos. So we're he we're all here to heal. I would say start in the step of talking to s tell one person, find someone you can trust that you could share. Look, I'm carrying this. I mean, I love men's groups for that reason, but it may not you may not be at a place you, you're ready to to join a men's group and come forward. Um, one of my shameful um, experiences that I partook in was uh, having a secret affair for five years. And in a long weekend um, with very loving women, uh, maybe 10 years ago, I was able to completely start moving that and getting rid of the, the guilt and the, the shame. And because I was, just, I was on, a, on a move to do that. Um, I also did other types of work, but I continued on it to neutralize it. So coming back to the guy, I, I would continue holding a space for yourself. And with these negative statements you find, the next thing that just came to me right now is self-compassion work. Mm -hmm. And I find the masculine has so much shame. I have masculine shame. My, the masculine part of me has shame. When, when the masculine doesn't feel they've done right. Mm -hmm. And men are supposed to do, you know, supposed to do, supposed to make the right. We're not uh, psychic, but we kind of, men act like they should have not, they, they shouldn't, you know, how could I have, I had some inkling that that wasn't the right, you know, but did you know really? Now you may know. And if you're judging yourself with new awareness from all that time that took previous to up to this moment, see, that's not fair. That's called counterfactual thinking, by the way, in, in psychology, um, because we think as if, you know, that could, well, that didn't. And this is all part of healing planet Earth, because who's a victim and who's a victimizer? 
no one and everyone. Yeah, yeah. Really. And, and it's not a siding square, but it's, it's a circle. It's two, two parts, you know, the, the male and the female. And the, that's why the uh, yin yang and the infinity sign is, is the way it is that we're really here. And, you know, we learn from, they're just pe people teach. I've learned on this series. I mean, I'll hear something that's like, aha, yes. And, and how do we, you know, and how do we tame? And in our families, we have hostilities. We have men carrying weight of, and, and so this, this exists everywhere that we want to move through releasing. So self-compassion, I'll just put a plug in for it. And you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull it you can get on YouTube, yeah. but there's, there's three steps. It's, it's not just sitting and watching a series like this. It's not just affirmations. It, it's not just singing, a, you know, some little ditty. It, it's really, um, it's starting with mindfulness that I get upset when I think of that, I do that, or I make a mistake in that area. I used to have terrible shame around money. If I thought I wasted even a, made a poor decision. Um, so whatever your triggers are, getting familiar with them and being mindful and going, <sighs> whenever I have that flash, whenever I see that woman, whenever I hear this word, I go into, be mindful. Okay, that, that's, that's something tough for me. This, the next one is a concept of universality, and the next one is stepping into self-kindness and actions that represent that. Universality is um, understanding that at some time when you comforted someone, you said everybody goes through that. Mm. Or you've heard people say, yeah, we all make mistakes. And in fact, if you can work on this, see, that is universal. That's universality that I'm chunking off a piece to work for myself and heal it, heal planet Earth, heal the cosmos. So there's a universality to it. You know, I may have invaded this woman's boundaries this way, but somebody else did. I just had a flash when I was hitchhiking to Florida. Yeah, I did some really risky things in college. Okay, so... I had this truck driver and he ended it at, through his, he's talking about a violation that he had performed, but he used very respectful language, to, you know, and I was sitting there realizing, hmm, I wonder if I'm safe. <laughs> this guy's yeah, yeah, sure. traveling, be revealing. And then but what he, came, he was in a place where he probably felt safe with you and the okay. timing was perfect. He needed to find someone to speak it to, to get it out. And fortunately, I got in that moment, in my young, I don't know if I was 19, 20, I said to him, I said, you're forgiven. And mm -hmm. something was calling me to just, because he was bereft. He was so down about not doing the what he had done. And I repeated, you know, because he would keep talking. And I, and by the end of the ride, I, I thought I remembered saying a final time, you're forgiven because I just felt that was <laughs> so. And I'll tell you, I, I, I can't remember any de what the de in fact, he didn't give really details, but he was talking about an event in which he wasn't, he did the wrong thing, he crossed, sure, sure. definitely invaded. So, um, so the second phase of, of self compassion is that, um, understanding it's a, a universality, and you know, it's amazing. How many people have had their boundaries invaded? Men are, are so hesitant to talk about, we hear women, yeah. there's so many men who have been hurt, mm -hmm. and their boundaries have been crossed. And for them to talk about it, see, that's emasculating. That's, I'm not a man that somehow I had that happen to me. So it's so hard for them. And it may be even more prevalent than what's happened to women. I, I don't know, but you know, boys get into these boys clubs and sports clubs and have, you know, or acolytes and um, assist priests. And they, we don't know how many, of, anyway, so it's, pro, it's universal and I'm universal because I'm connecting to it. Yeah. And so the final thing is how can you be self-kind to yourself? Yeah. 
how were you self kind to somebody else who, who came to you and needed your help? Yeah. Now, maybe, you, you know, I think I've run across somebody who he couldn't think of who actually had ever come to him. He's dealing with a lot and a lot of healing. But I will tell you that you, most of you <laughs> have listened and what, and think about what did that person really need when they came to you? Yeah. And they probably needed like, like you've been saying, PJ, just listen. They just wanted to be heard and just your heart open and just doing, mm -hmm, or which is not masculine. <laughs> it's more the feminine and, and women do a lot of this and men don't. Oh, I hear that. Mm. I'm here just to hear. I, I don't even know what to say, but, but I, I, I want to comfort you. I wish I could take that away. I wish I had a magic wand, but, but talk to me, tell me, I, I, yes, I hear that you did something you, you didn't like. I hear that you weren't happy. You know, all of us make mistakes, shit happens. What, what, you know, so it's giving that kindness to yourself. It's being self kind in the exact same way. And for a lot of men, it's tough. It's hard for the masculine shame to do that, but it means starting with just even if you have to sort of do it in a contrived stop, the next time I get to a parking space, I'm going to take a moment and give myself a self kind that I didn't like that I gave the guy the thing, her the thing, I didn't like whatever. And I, I really was violent in my thoughts, my words, my thinking. Um, I'm going to take a mind, I'm going to pull, I'm going to, I'm going to address this with myself and give myself a moment. The second thing that you said was, um, being compassionate with yourself. And this last thing that you're saying is... The second thing was universality. It's an idea of universality. Okay, for some reason I thought it was um, well, passion for yourself. Is that the first? Well, let's see. The, fir the first one is being mindful of what are my triggers. Okay, okay. And the next two I go in different directions with them. So the next two is the concept of universality. Okay, I got time. Okay. The last one is actionizing self-kindness so uh, somewhere along the lines during our conversation i thought you talked about one of the first things that men need to do is have a sense of uh, compassion for themselves and so my question is in regards to what i thought i heard and what i'm hearing now about the self-kindness what's the difference between self-kindness and mm -hmm. self-compassionate yeah yes, yes. Uh, they would be one and the same okay. but um, there's been so much in the last 20 years, this wasn't even a field before that, but um, that, it, it, that sometimes self-compassion is, um, oh, I got I to gotta give myself a pat, what's my win for the day? Yeah. Or I got to look at myself and do the mirror work. You're great, you're good, you can do this, it's going to have a great day. It's, um, it's, it's not just that, it can involve that. But that's an oversimplification. So self-kind, self-compassion, I would see them as the same. But if you're really going to embody it, it's working with being in the gutter, too. Like, wow. I don't feel happy about what, that's a trigger for me. Okay. And so, would you say that compassion, oneself, um, that there is a requisite element of going into the gutter. Like if I really have compassion for myself, then we should go back and sort of pick up our past a little bit. Like if I really care about myself or I really want to care about myself or I recognize that I'm supposed to care about myself, but I don't, I, I'm wondering, you recommend that men go back and look at that gutter. And then like you said, tell someone, find someone to speak to, to get it out. Is that part of compassion for the oneself? Yes, yes, that would be necessary <laughs> work. Now, I don't advocate, I like what you said about even your limitations after your illness. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not a big person that wants to hover and stay stuck mm -hmm. and marinate. So, but that said, if a trigger, if something comes up and, and I'm feel or I notice it, or it could be an unconscious thing, Somebody even points out to me, hey, did you realize you were hostile about that guy? You know, 
or um, or somebody in the family saying, you know, I, I like your honesty. It's it's the way you said it that, that hurt my feel. So, you know, you'll get feedback or you'll get a trigger or something will so bother you or you'll find yourself in this. So I'm very young. And so young says when the, when they come up, work with them, deal with them. My eyes twitching. That must be a really big. Uh -huh. uh, so it's not like we arrive. It's it's always moving. And sometimes, and I think sometimes there's when we think of self compassion, self -com or we we get into this kumbaya talk. Um, it's like skip over the gutter. Well, we we don't want to marinate there, but when we need to to get it, we're in it. Uh, that's where we are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I, I don't. I like a full moon, but yeah. you know, it's a little moon tonight, <laughs> last night, you know, but we don't appreciate being in the sun unless we also are in the, you know, the contrast. So, and overcoming that is, you know, that, that's like an orgasm. That's like, uh -huh. that's huge to overcome something, you know, and, and our, each process is unique, you know, yours is yours and my, yeah. So I think that, um, very similar to what you're saying. Um, I think that it's important to address that stuff that's in the gutter. And two things I would, I would uh, maybe like support on what you're saying or just maybe add a little to is that idea that if you're in the gutter, you're already, you're already dirty, right? You're not mm -hmm. going to get much more dirty. And so mm -hmm. how do we, if you don't like being dirty, how do we help you get clean? right? How do you help you get clean? And if your mind is saying, I can't get clean, I don't deserve to get clean. I did this. I deserve to be punished. By whom? Like, if you really are genuinely, genuinely remorseful, then no matter what has happened in your past, if you're genuinely remorseful, no matter whether the person in your past or the people in your past have the ability or the um, desire to forgive you, in those moments, you then can forgive yourself because you go, I would never do that now. I absolutely see what I did. And maybe I understand it. Maybe I don't understand it. But I do know who I am now would never do that. And in fact, who I am now would stop anyone else that I found doing that because I know that it's so wrong. And that authenticity, that honest sense of what is not okay for you anymore is a doorway that allows you to begin to forgive yourself, which means also that sense of self-compassion, right? Um, secondly, I would say that if you are of the, the masculine persuasion where you want to resist and fight things, um, look at that self that's in the gutter, not yourself, but the piece, the dark piece. So visualize, see, the dark piece stepping out of the innocence of you. Let the innocence of you climb up and out of the gutter. Okay? And find its way to you, the current you. And allow that innocence, I'm asking you to visualize. Ask that innocence to climb out of the gutter. Find its way to you, the current you. Join with you. Like I'll have it hug you and steep into you. I'll have it walk behind your back and step into you. It doesn't matter. However you want to do it, have that innocence join you. And then if, that, if you look at that darkness as another entity, how would you handle that if it were trying to attack you? And if the case is that you're beating yourself up, that's a form of, a talk, of attack. That's a form of self-abuse. You're not actually being um, gentle or kind uh, with yourself. You're not being self-aware. You're allowing the unconscious mind in these cases to beat you up. And all the unconscious mind is doing is saying, hey, this hurt so bad. We were hurting when we did this. We didn't like it then. We sure, certainly don't like it now. Mm -hmm. And we are going to, we, meaning it, the unconscious mind is going to say, and I'm going to make it so painful for you that you're going to carry it for the rest of your life until you realize and make a commitment and make a new plan. So if you ever find yourself in that kind of situation, again, make a new plan so that you know that you're going to do something different and commit to that new plan. Then all of a sudden, that guilt, that shame, that dark monster, that dirty creature that invaded you and caused and created that action will begin to dissipate. So find a way to look at that dark thing and go, okay, maybe we got to wrestle. 
you know, maybe you reach out in your mind and you go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to wide you up like a piece of paper. And I'm going to throw you over my, my shoulder. Maybe I'm going to wide you up like a piece of paper, turn you inside out, take you to the bathroom, lift up the toilet, throw you in the toilet, shut the lid, flush it, wash my hands, wash my face, say a quick prayer of gratitude and turn around and walk away and leave it. Like find a way to deal with that. That is an oppressor. That is someone who is actually assaulting and attacking your present life and proclaiming you are the guilty one. You are the one who did this crime. And the truth is you, the conscious you of today is not the one who did that crime. Mm. Mm. The you of yesterday might have been influenced to do that crime based on whatever the unconscious programming had been up to that point for you until you were able to come into a level of self-awareness and awareness of others and that compassion that comes with that um, to be able to then shift and become the man that you become today. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you for asking. I'm, I'm thinking what we'll do is start wrapping it up, but I have another session with you. I'm going to keep it because okay. you're so interesting. And I so appreciate this. And um, I thought just in case people don't listen to the other one, what, um, what is your, do you have something to offer the audience, the listeners that Okay. Um, I think there's a couple of different options for them. If they just want to talk to me and they're like, hey, that sounds really good. Like I'm, I'm struggling with some stuff. If it's okay with you, I'd love to extend an offer for them to jump on a free one-on-one with me. If that's not comfortable for you, that's okay. Because oh. I know you're also a counselor. Okay. Oh, that's very generous of you. Very generous. So they can jump on a call with me and we'll make sure that you have the link so you can share the link with them. Um, and then it's just a, it's a free 20 or 30 minute call where we jump on and we just like, let's connect. Let's find out where you are and what you're struggling with. Let's wrestle that thing together. Mm -hmm. So instead of like going out as a one person, you know, trying to hunt down the woolly mammoth or that mastodon, let's go out as a team and we, you know, we stand a better chance against that darkness that oppressed you in the past. Um, and the other option is I run a program called Transformation 2020. So if people want to do a group coaching and they're like, maybe I don't want to do this by myself, but you know, I'd be interested to listen to this guy, you know, um, reach out and ask me about transformation 2020. Just go to transformation 2020.pjswisdom.com. So, and again, the link will be in the, the show notes, I'm sure. Is that okay? Oh, that's so generous and so beautiful. Oh, I thank you so much. Bum, 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 bum.